Part one. You will hear a conversation between a travel agent and a customer. You have thirty seconds to look at questions one to ten. Cretan Holiday Homes. This is Emily speaking. How may I help? Hi. Well, I'm planning a holiday to Crete this summer, and a friend of mine who stayed with you last year recommended you. He stayed with his family at one of your seaside properties in Chania and said the house was excellent. So I was wondering if I could ask a few questions about the houses you're advertising on your brochure. Of course. Just give me a second to get a form. Okay. So first of all, have you decided on the dates you'll be travelling to Crete yet? We're still working on that. It's quite a big island, and my husband and I were thinking of starting with Chania, then moving on to Rithymno for a few days, and just using a rental car to get to Heraklion and Lysithi. I don't know if that makes much sense. You probably know better than I do. Well, most of our clients choose a similar route. Although they usually prefer to make one home their base and use the car to go everywhere else. Yeah, I thought of that, but the problem is, is that Chania is on the westernmost side of the island, and I'm assuming the distances will be big, so it'll take a while to get all the way to Lysithi from there. But my husband and I really want to stay there for a bit. All of our friends who've been there have really sold us on the idea. It's true. Chania is an extremely beautiful region, and you're right. The distances are definitely big. Thankfully, we do have properties in both Chania and in Rithymno. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. Do you have any specific properties in mind? Yeah, I've got a few here. Excellent. So let me just quickly take down your details, and then we can have a look at the properties. How does that sound? Sure. So, do you mind giving me your name? Sure. It's Patty Parrot. My surname is spelled like the bird, but with a single R. Great. And a telephone number? O two o two, eight three three, eight nine two four. Thank you. Have you decided yet when you'll be travelling to Crete exactly? We were thinking late summer, probably the end of August or the beginning of September. We want to skip the midsummer rush. That's a good idea. We'll have better availability then. So, which properties were you interested in? I like the look of the one by the old port in Chania. Is that the one bedroom or the two bedroom flat? I think it's the one bedroom flat, the one above the jewellery shop. Yeah, that's the one bed. So what I was wondering was, what sort of facilities should I expect in the flat? So the flat is fully furnished with a bathroom and a kitchen. It has an AC in the bedroom and a small balcony with a seaside view. And how much does that cost? That's sixty pounds per night. All right, not too bad. The next property I was thinking of is the Maisonette in Old Town. Is that the one in the east or the west part of town? On the brochure, it says Masonette in the old town. I don't know. Wait. Yep. Here it is. West. Great. So that's also got one bedroom with a small kitchen and a bathroom. I'm afraid there's no oven in the property, so you won't be able to cook any hot meals there. And at the moment, the air conditioning is not working. But I'm sure that will be fixed by the time you stay there. And how much is that? That's a little bit cheaper. Twenty pound less per night than the first one, so forty pounds. Okay, and I was looking at one more in Chania, and then we can move on to the ones in Rithymno. Excellent. Which one's that? It's just called the Loft. Looks like it's also an old town. Ah, yes, that's a really popular one. 
So, I'm a little bit confused because the brochure says it can accommodate up to four guests, but I can only see one bedroom in the picture. Yeah, there's one bedroom and a sofa that opens into a bed. Young people and students tend to prefer this property for that reason. Oh, so does it get noisy at night? Oh no, not at all. The old town is a lively area for sure, but nothing extreme. It's like the other two properties. And what about the facilities? So there's the bedroom and the living room, as I mentioned. There's also a kitchenette and a bathroom with a jacuzzi. And, of course, the rooftop, where you can see the whole city. And how much is it? That one's a bit pricier, £75 per night. Hmm. I'll have to think about it. I think we'll go for the first one, but I'll have to discuss it with my husband first. Of course. Shall we go through your options for Rathimno as well? Yeah, there's a property there. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide give a talk about a museum. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 20. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hat Museum. I'll try to keep this introduction short, as I can imagine you're all quite keen to have a walk around the museum and look at our exhibits, but I would encourage you to pay attention to the information I'll be giving you, as it will make your visit smoother and more fun. I'd like to start by apologizing for the very short opening times this week. As you can see, part of the museum is being renovated at the moment, which is why certain sections are not open to the public. I'll get back to that in a bit. Our usual opening hours are 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but due to the works, we'll be closing down a bit earlier at 3 p.m. today. Still, it's only 11 o'clock now, which means you have four hours to get through everything and soak in all the beautiful hats. You're welcome to leave and return anytime you like, but please note the last admission is at 2.30 p.m., half an hour before closing time. Now, as you can see here, we've got a very large hall which serves as an introduction to the museum and which is where you'll find most of our extra facilities, such as the restrooms on your left and the shop and cafe on your right. Those of you with children are also welcome to visit our recreation office behind the shop, where you'll find resources for your kids such as quizzes, questionnaires, sheets for drawing, and other handouts. If we have any teachers in our midst today, you might also find this useful if you'd like to plan a future visit with your class. The museum is not particularly large, but you'll find it has a very ergonomic design. Starting with the room on our left, you will find the Ancient World section, with replicas of the types of skull caps and straw hats ancient Greek and Romans wore. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. The next room jumps forward quite a few centuries and transports you to 17th century Britain, where we have a small but impressive collection of original headgear. The rest of the museum's left section continues in the same vein, 
moving through the centuries all the way to the present with a very large section dedicated to 20th century Europe. By the time you reach that section, you'll find yourself halfway through the semicircle of the row of rooms in the museum. This is the part where I'm afraid your visit will be slightly disrupted due to the renovation works I mentioned earlier. The right-hand section of the museum is dedicated to the journey of specific types of hats throughout history and the impact they've had on society. We've got a room dedicated to fedora hats, another to top hats, and yet another to berets and quite a few more. Unfortunately, one of these rooms is currently closed and will remain so for the next eight months. This is because of the fire that broke out in the museum a few weeks ago, which I'm sure you all heard about in the news. Thankfully, most of the exhibits in the fedora room were salvaged, but still, we have had to shut the room to fix it. Since this was our most popular room, however, we decided to move the exhibits temporarily to the cowboy hat room. What this all means for you is that when you reach the final room on the left-hand side of the semicircle, instead of being able to continue straight ahead into the right-hand side, you'll have to exit, skip the next room, and move on to the second room on the right-hand side, the bowler hat room. Now, just a few final words and then I'll let you be on your way. As you can imagine, most of our original hats are fragile and therefore exhibited in glass cases. Some of the replicas, however, are exhibited on mannequins. I hope this goes without saying, but trying on these hats is strictly prohibited. And we would greatly appreciate it if you carefully monitored your children. The hats should be out of reach for them, but we have had cases of children knocking down our mannequins to reach the hats, so please be extra vigilant. You will have the chance to try out hats in the shop if you wish to, and we have many different sizes for adults and children alike. Also, you are welcome to take pictures of the hats if you would like, but please do not use flash, as this can damage our more fragile hats. If you've forgotten your cameras, fear not. There's a phenomenal selection of photos and postcards in our shop. Now, finally, as some of you might know already, the Hat Museum is run entirely by volunteers. We do not charge an entrance fee, but you are encouraged to leave your donations in this box here by the entrance. Please be advised that we accept all currencies. Now, enough of my rambling on. Time for you to go in and enjoy our magnificent... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and a student about dissertation research. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 30. Hi, Agnieszka. Have a seat. Hi, thank you. So, I take it you've finished your interviews for your dissertation? I have, yes. And have you had a chance to analyse the data yet? Oh, yes. I've prepared a graph as well. Excellent. Uh, let's have a look. Wow, that's quite comprehensive. Well done. OK, can you talk me through it a bit? Sure. So, like we discussed in our previous meeting, I decided to focus on just two nationalities rather than simply questioning everyone. It made it a bit more difficult to find enough participants, but I'm glad I took your advice because it was much easier to identify patterns in the responses. 
I did consider briefly going for three nationalities, one from continental Europe, one from Britain and one from further afield. But I don't think one European country would be representative of the whole continent, so I decided against it. I'm glad you did. Uh, Remember, the narrower the scope, the clearer the results. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Did you go for Polish and English then? I did, yes. I created a survey and passed it around to a couple of friends of mine, one from the UK and one studying at a university in Poland. I also got in touch with the Polish community in the area and asked my friends and acquaintances to pass the survey around to their parents because I wanted to get answers from as many age groups as possible. Very good. Did you use the internet to find people as well? I did. I posted the survey on my social media and on forums and pages for Polish immigrants in London. So what was the response rate? It was actually quite good, much higher than I'd anticipated. I got about 200 responses from UK citizens and around 250 from Polish people in the 18 to 25 age group. Then about 150 each from both nationalities in the 25 to 40 group and around 200 in total in the 41 and over group. Well, that's quite impressive. So what did you find out? Well, unsurprisingly, the majority of respondents under 26 from both countries were far more positive about immigration. 45% of young Polish people and 59% of young British people said that immigration had a positive effect on London. Another 32% and 26% respectively said the effect was neutral. And only 23% of Poles and 15% of Britons said immigration was a bad thing for the city. Uh, What about the other two groups? The findings in the 25 to 40 age group were very similar, but the 41 and over group were massively different. Only 28% of Poles and 31% of Britons said immigration was a positive thing, and a huge 35% and 38% said it was bad. Did you think about splitting the group into smaller categories, for example, 40 to 55 and then 56 and over? I did think about it, but the thing is that I asked people to write their exact age as well as ticking the age group category just to be able to check if there'd be differences between those closer to 40 and those much, much older. But I didn't find any notable ones, so I don't think splitting them would have made a difference. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. And what were the reasons people gave, generally? Well, unsurprisingly, the main thing younger people mentioned was that London is culturally enriched by immigrants who bring their customs and their cuisine and their language with them. And this has contributed, in their opinion, to making London the world city it is today. People from other age groups agreed with this, but the problem they had with immigration was the perception that people arriving to the UK are often resistant to change and might not be willing to adapt to the existing customs, which they felt defined their nationality. Oh, unemployment was also a major concern for many, as well as the perceived rise in crime in certain areas. OK, anything else? Yeah, some people also mentioned that the city is getting overcrowded and that's having an effect on housing, but not many of them thought it would be much better if there was less immigration. And any other positives? Well, actually, there was something quite surprising in the 25 to 40 age group. About 20% said one of the things they loved about immigration in London was the fact that it contributed to creating so many new romantic relationships between Britons and foreigners. Now that's interesting. Yeah, and of course many of them also mentioned that the British economy has thrived thanks to the constant stream of skilled tax-paying immigrants. Of course. Uh, Anything else? Um, There were quite a few more things, but I think those are the main ones. 
I have to say there were some very interesting personal stories that people contributed anonymously, both in the online and the paper survey. I had a section at the end where I asked people to write any positive or negative experiences they've had with immigrants, or because they themselves were immigrants. And I've got a bank of fascinating examples. Great. Are you planning to reference any of these in your presentation? Yeah, I've picked a couple of positive and a couple of negative experiences from each nationality. There are plenty more, but I'll add these to my dissertation because it would take too long to read more than four. All right then,、uh, let's have a look. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the characteristics of left-handed people. You have thirty seconds to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Being left-handed was once seen as a sign of the devil, who was said to baptize his followers with his left hand. It was also thought to be a sign of witchcraft. Joan of Arc, who was famously burnt at the stake, was often depicted as left-handed in art. As a result, parents in previous centuries often tied their left-handed children's hands behind their backs and forced them to learn how to write with their right hand. Leading, we know now, not only to bad handwriting, but also to poor concentration, unruly behavior, shyness, bad memory, and reading difficulties, as well as fatigue and neuroticism. But what do we actually know about left-handedness? For a phenomenon that has existed since the early days of humanity and even further back, surprisingly little. We know that we have been predominantly right-handed for at least five hundred thousand years. At least, according to research conducted by the University of Kansas, and we know that, contrary to popular opinion, being left-handed doesn't necessarily mean being right-brained. In fact, while 95% of right-handed people use their left half of their brain more, up to 70% of left-handed people actually do the same. We also know that there's a long list of advantages and disadvantages associated with being a lefty. By the way, that's spelt with a Y at the end. Not an I.E. as left-handed people are often called. Let's start with the advantages, shall we? It might surprise you to hear that most of these advantages have to do with the fact that left-handed people grow up in a world that overwhelmingly favors and expects right-handedness. Take sport, for example. Left-handed people are more likely to excel in sports with one opponent, but this is not generally due to a naturally higher sporting ability. It has more to do with how often they get to practice against their opponents. Living in a right-handed world, left-handed people get a chance to play against right-handed people far more often, thus growing more adept at anticipating a right-handed opponent's moves than a right-handed person might with a left-handed opponent, as there are so few left-handed opponents out there. Similarly, left-handed people recover from illnesses more quickly than right-handed people, but once again. This isn't some innate characteristic they're born with. Scientists believe it's because left-handed people often need to strengthen both sides of their brain in order to thrive in our right-handed world. While a right-handed person does not have to struggle to use a pair of scissors or drive in most countries, for example, a left-handed person will need to take that one extra step in order to teach their left hand to mirror the movements of a right hand. Then, of course, there are those advantages which I personally do not find as strong or empirically proven, such as the idea that left-handed people tend to become presidents more often, or that they are more creative. It has indeed been proven that left-handed people are better at divergent thinking, 
but this just means that they're better able to examine a situation from all points of view rather than that they possess more creativity. At any rate, as Professor Ronald Yeo suggests, it's incredibly hard to measure something like creativity. And there are, unfortunately, plenty of disadvantages linked to left-handedness as well. As I mentioned before, driving is one. The UK is a notable exception here, as left-handed people tend to pass their driving exams more easily than right-handed people because the gear stick and the lever are both on the left-hand side in UK cars. Unfortunately, most Western countries drive on the right, which puts left-handed drivers at a disadvantage. Moreover, an Australian study from 2009 found that left-handed children were more likely to have issues in reading and writing, but also in their motor skills and the way they develop socially. Most children, the researchers said, catch up with their right-handed classmates as they get older, but that's not always the case. Then there's the 2013 study, which was conducted at Yale University, and which discovered that left-handed people are more likely to suffer from schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders, as well as the score of studies suggesting a link between left-handedness and dyslexia, ADHD, PTSD, etc. But, as I said before, it's not all bad for left-handed people. Setting aside the advantages and disadvantages, what most researchers now agree on is that whether you're left-handed or right-handed doesn't really affect you that much at the end of the day. Sure, you will often be met with curiosity and have to answer the pointless question of are you left-handed when somebody sees you using your left hand to write. And you might get your left hand as well as your writing smudged if you decide to use a fountain pen. But overall, the differences between left-handedness and right-handedness are so subtle and so insignificant that they're not enough to create two distinctive categories of people. It does, however, accentuate the fact that humans are varied and diverse for reasons we often misunderstand. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You're never gonna make it, you're not good enough There's a million other people with the same stuff You really think you're different, man, you must be kidding Think you're gonna hit it, but you just don't get it It's impossible, it's not probable, you're irresponsible Too many obstacles, you gotta stop it, yo You gotta take it slow, you can't be a pro, don't waste your time no more Who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? I don't give a damn if you say you disapprove I'm gonna make my move, I'm gonna make it soon And I'll do it cause it's what I wanna fucking do Cause all these opinions and all these positions They come in in millions, they block in your vision But no, you can't listen, that shit is all fiction Cause you hold the power as long as you're driven make it. There's no way that you make it And maybe you can fake it But you're never gonna make it Are you just gonna 